matches. Uh, but heading into our first game, I do think it's going to be the standard stuff for the most part. We were having a little bit of a discussion off uh, a stream in the break about whether or not it was correct to go for double Octobot in that start. Uh, and I think you uh, raised a very good point that while Octobot is good, making sure you have the value, the card draw to go with that reduction so you don't run out of stuff is very, very important too. That's right. And you did make the good argument that if there was just a single swindle or field contact, suddenly you're very happy about keeping the double Octobot. But then we have to ask, why the Vanessa? And so right. <laughs> uh, we'll see if Alan approaches the matchup a little bit differently. No option for Octobot at the start, but he does have Neophyte on curve. Definitely looks quite powerful. And Tiz is just going to start off with his card draw. Coin guess the weight into another guess the weight. It often feels bad to use the coin to p potentially like delay your glowfly, but he does have lightning bloom, so I favor him spending his mana efficiently and just getting the card draw rolling, keeping the hand space streamlined as well. Whew. This is an interesting start now for Alan because obviously Foxy Swindle uh, at this point looks very, very powerful. Uh, but Colt Neophyte on two is the one turn where it can't be hit with uh, Lunar Eclipse, which is a pretty important factor in just getting it out early. Especially as he could next turn, if he wanted to, just go Field Contact and Colt Neophyte again. And then if uh, the Lunar Eclipse is in hand, which one do you even target at that point? Yeah, I mean, he's got to target the Lunar Eclipse, but then Alan's still pretty happy with that outcome. So I really yeah. like this approach to the matchup. Uh, Neophyte on curve, denies the Eclipse, like you said, and uh, field contact with step. If not denying um, Eclipse, quiet. is still going to deny the Eclipse into Fungal Fortunes, right? Oh, yeah. Which is yeah, exactly. very big here. And, and you're playing the game of if they don't have exactly Lunar Eclipse, they kind of just lose the game anyway, because then you just draw a trillion cards, reduce everything with Octo as well. Uh, it's a very strong gambit. And I love that Alan is just playing, uh, you know, calling his bluff, saying you have to have the Luna to stay in this game. If Tiz really wanted to, he could, like, Lightning Bloom first into Lunar Fungal. Hmm. Does that work? That would work, yeah. Yeah. But then he's super overloaded the next turn. It's probably not worth it, right? Just take a turn to Lunar and be a little bit sad. The lightning's too valuable oh. in his gibberling. No, that wouldn't work, actually. Sorry. He'd have one mana left over, so that's not even a possibility. Hmm. I wonder. And so it does oh. just have to be the Lunar. Alan has. Foxy Swindle ends on Octobot, and by then he has a gajillion cards with the field contact. If a discount happens, Alan kind of just wins, and Tiz needs to play something on board, right? Is it ever just field contact one thief here? Like, you've just seen a Lunar Eclipse. It's very unlikely they have the second one. You could just put down another field contact. I, I guess because the rest of his turn is so powerful, you can deviate away from it, but... I feel like this covers all his bases. He gets yeah. to draw, so using the cards that aren't discounted kind of just pay for themselves because he's drawing into two more. And then you get the field contact in the discount pool, which means if Tiz does anything here, like his strongest possible play is something like eight, uh, Glowfly, then you can proc the discount mm. on the Octobot and have that huge pop-off with Kazakus or field contact. I think this covers Alan's... Um, worst case scenario really well. And I feel here like it's actually supposed to be just straight up fungal fortunes because the one card I'm looking for here realistically is either lightning bloom or double innovate so that you can go glow fly and soul on the same turn to try and stick something. Uh, he does go for the gibbling instead which is kind of the other way you can approach this. Uh, it does activate the octobot but I guess it gives him the chance of being able to go for this where you play power of the wild as well i mean all things considered that was an insane fungal if he's starting gibberling i thought this right. was kind of just saying if this gibber gibberling procs only once then all right too bad but the lightning bloom was too expensive right because he has so much overload for the next turn ends up on you'd have to assume oh okay don't know this is smart right because he does assume this board to get uh, assume this board to get cleared up because the Octobot is sticking, right. so he wants a way to generate another board. Well, either way, it is absolutely go time for Alan here. Whatever Tiz is faffing about with, you do not care, because you are going 
turbo right now. Uh, spring water, whatever, deep freeze, sure. Picks himself up a nature study off Vanessa, but he'll probably just Kazakas if he doesn't get that much better to do off the brain freeze. Yeah, I think realistically just looking for like shadow step Ooh. here. Prize plunderer looks premium to me. Not enough board space to go both Vanessa and Ogmerchant on your own guy, but I guess he can just trade his own guy and then mm -hmm. Ogmerchant the other one to keep it safe so he can end on Vanessa. Okay, this is smart as well. Just keep more stats in play. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so strong. What can Druid deal, uh, do to deal with all this? Like, he's just played a better Glowfly Swarm here. Oh, sorry, it was power. That was the last card. And that's just really good here. What the heck? <laughs> yeah, that's even better. And Tiz is overloaded. It's just such a disaster. Yeah, Alan's got this one in the bag. There are effectively no roots back into the game at this point. Like, I, I guess with if he doesn't die by some miracle, then he can go for Runic that he discovered plus... Uh, soul of the forest, but he doesn't even have the ability to get enough mana for it next turn. He throws in the towel. Tiz is not taking that one. 1-0 to Alan. Huge first win with the Rogue. As we were talking about, if Tiz takes the win here, it was just looking like two favorable matchups left with the Warlock and the Mage. So Alan should be uh, very, very happy with himself after that win. Definitely. I just found it a little bit funny at the end there. Tis conceded after seeing the Neophyte point face first <laughs> before anything, so he knows, okay, it's getting played again this turn. Alan yep. will have the Tenwu Neophyte in the Power of the Wild to, like, not set up, uh, not get immediate lethal, but set it up and make Tiz's next turn completely inefficient. It's just too powerful. When you get the Octobot plus card draw, it's two pieces of the puzzle though, and so I feel that um, timing and mulligans on the Rogue for this matchup are super important. As for implications for the series as a whole, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier where you said this loss for Tiz is not nearly as bad it would have been for Alan if he had taken a loss in terms of overall series position, because Tiz has some strong counter queue options. Priest into the Druid, pretty Priest favored, not disastrous for Druid, but this Priest has Ogre Mancer as well, so I find it a bit difficult to say that the Druid can get over the line. And then Alan has two options to queue into the Priest, but then Tiz, with the fact that his Rogue is remaining and has a decent matchup against both the Mage and the Warlock, I think Tiz is still fine overall in the series, his Rogue just needs to get two wins. Yeah, I think he's looking fine. I think this uh, combo priest as well, very aptly named, given that the uh, the combo is Yog plus spells in this deck, a very old and powerful combo indeed. Um, uh, yeah, obviously just a joke in there, but I, I think that it's just a very, very good deck overall for the rest of the series. It has the counter queue of Warlock still available, but I, I do still just believe that Priest is in a really good position against Rogue. It struggles so much to deal enough damage, the, the Rogue is that, sorry, uh, the Rogue does, uh, to the Priest, and especially with all this healing available, Samuro, Appa, Renews, he's not running the Desperate Prayers, which obviously gives you a little bit of extra burst of healing that we saw yesterday, uh, but still, I think, a perfectly good matchup for the priest. Yeah, I think the prayers are honestly not that great against Rogue. While the sure. Rogue can threaten a bunch of damage in the late game, they're often trying to piece it together in such a way that um, if you use Desperate Prayer, it's only going to heal for getting out of one specific breakpoint and a lot of the time you'd rather pair the prayer to uh, get a big clear with the Zyrella so I much prefer that Tiz is running proactive things in his priest the double Sethix in there which I thought were super core but High 3 disagrees with that and uh, the Yogg at the top end you know, I don't hate that. It might be pretty good if he gets into one of those disaster worst case scenario last resort situations <laughs> Yogg's good. Yogg's just a good card. People forget it uh, because there's kind of more uh, emphasis placed on pure raw damage in this metagame with Mage and Rogue being very, very powerful and Token Druid often pushing people out of the game before Yogg can come online. But if you get it active, it does absolutely brutally powerful things. Uh, but getting into the series now, Tom picking up what was a decent starting hand already with the Octobot, uh, what is turning into a gorgeous starting hand now. I like how you just said Tom because they're both numbers gamers. Oh my god. Alan Apologies. Six Alan. digit gamer. Yes. <laughs> um, 
It's out six digits, just better than us. Single digit and double digits in this game. <laughs> um, efficient Octobot on this turn doesn't feel especially great because Tiz could have answered with a Scorpid potentially, and Alan didn't have a way to proc his own Octobot. So going to take it a bit slower, get the Man Crick down, and then maybe use that Octobot either if he needs to um, to cheapen the field contact turn or if it's available, cheapen the Alex 10 move combo. Kind of surprising to see Shadow Earth ruin there to me. I was looking at Gift of Luminance. Uh, even though I'm aware he has no minions in hand at all, uh, there's really limited spots where Shadow Earth ruin is good against Rogue. Like, it's only Jandis that you're realistically looking at, or I guess Kazaka Golems, uh, that I guess maybe make it worth it, because he did keep a card that he hasn't played, so maybe it's Kazakas. Yeah, I think it's really the Golems that justify the keep, or the pick from Tiz. Alan now... Able to proc the Swindle with his Octobot, and by the time he draws his next card, he's very likely to have picked up a way to proc the Octobot, even if yep. Tiz plays something like Scorpid. And it's kind of hard for Tiz to get rid of this in one fell swoop. In fact, there's no way in hand to do so. That's true. Uh, and I really like that you actually bring up Scorpid there. It's something I wanted to talk about from Alan's side, is the fact that he didn't just play Octobot on two. Uh, is specifically to play around Scorpid. Very often you will find yourself in a situation where you play it, you go man crick afterwards, and then they just, you know, they play the Scorpid, and there's nothing you can do to kill it off, and you just don't get the discount. Uh, whereas here, he's seen that it isn't there. But his is going for Psych Split on the Octobot to reduce his own hand? Rename this card to Spicy Split there. I think Tiz was saying, <laughs> all right, Alan's drawn so many cards, he's very likely to be able to proc this, even if I don't play a minion. So I need to prepare for the disaster. Let me discount my own hand, because Alan has to get an extremely strong prize plunder to deal mm. six damage in the first place. It just so happens that Alan didn't have a way to proc the Octovod, and so Tiz might be, like, if you watch his back the VOD, um, rolling his eyes at this. I honestly kind of like the play from Tiz, but obviously Alan is going to have a field day this turn. Yeah, and I think Alan here is thinking, is there any way that I can get a big enough prize plunder to not have to proc my opponent's Octobot, because he's just going back and forth, back and forth between do you play the field contact first or do you bump first? Uh, and in the end, he goes for the one thief plan, looking for devolving missiles exactly, I would guess here. Yeah, you'd have to imagine. Oh, the mind games here are insane. Yeah. Like, Tiz psyche splitting in the first place, respecting Alan's ability to proc the Octobot. And then Alan... Digging and clawing for a way to not discount Tiz's hand because he feels like Tiz would only go for that play if there was some sort of disaster discount for him. Again, the discounts are still pretty powerful, but you can kind of just look at this mostly as another palm reading having been played. That's pretty sick though. Ogamancer Condemn. You can even put an Apotheosis on it if you want, just to make it even more survivable. The amount of mana these players are working with is absurd. This was a 10 mana turn that Tiz displayed for six. <laughs> you can play the smite too for the full oh my clear. God. Yeah. However, smite last card is pretty relevant for Vanessa. I think if Tiz wanted to play around Vanessa specifically, he's meant to end on Apotheosis because it feels like the most useless card for Alan at the moment. Um, the big news yeah. for Alan, though, is that he still has ways to get to Prize Plunder. On its own, probably not going to be enough to deal with the Ogre Mancer, but paired with one spell, you're okay spawning 1-2-2 two, two in order to get that thing out of the way. Alan here just going absolutely gangbusters, though, with all this draw, all this reduction. Even the Alex draws are on the left is very, very relevant just to be able to go for Burst at the end of all of this. You're so right. Okay. Two more battle cries he can play that are not spells and so are not going to proc any tutus. Still searching for the prize plunder. No that is. Oh no, it's not going to overdraw. He can still play the coin afterwards, so this is fine. Still oh. hasn't found it. He'll overdraw the pen flinger if he plays brain freeze, right? Or he something will, yeah. will overdraw. <laughs> yeah. He has to coin first or he'll lose the pen flinger, as you said, which I think is but fine. But every spell is a disaster because of the tutus. Well, I guess it's not yeah. that bad, but the real disaster is the fact that he just did not find prize plunder after all of these draws, both of them bottom 13. 
Okay, not a, not a disaster of a turn. If he wants to end with the coin, he won't overdraw. Uh, but honestly, I think it's reasonable to say that coin is more valuable than an average card in his deck. He's found both Wicked Stabs, he's found Alex. Yeah. Uh, it's only Tenwu that would be truly disastrous. And he would overdraw because the Penflinger returns to hand. Oh, right, you are, yeah. Uh, oh. Coin Holy Smite or something, but yeah, either way. It just spawns more tutus. Alan was in yeah. such a difficult situation. I don't think it was possible to avoid overdrawing while still giving himself the best odds of getting prize plunder, which was really the whole point of this turn. Tis out of condemns though, so it's not the easiest board state to deal with. I guess he goes fishing with Renew for any type of AoE. Yeah, bump, heal. Uh, I mean, AoE, honestly just value, like finding any kind of card draw uh, would be pretty sick here, like Insight. Yeah. I think you got to bite the bullet and take that. Like the look of it. Zogramats are still just not dead My on board, and destroyed. if it eats even... Oh no! Big overdraw. Zogramats <sighs> are eats one. even a single um, Wicked Stab. That's a win for Tiz, right? And we're seeing it's going to eat an Alex shot because he wow. um, doesn't want to spawn any more minions. He wants to preserve his board. I like the line a lot from Alex. Me too. Uh, I think that this is one of the things you often have to explore very heavily against Priest is, yes, the burn plan with Alex and Tenwu is super powerful, uh, but they can pick it apart fairly easily by healing or Elusha, more importantly, later on. Uh, whereas this is an 8-8 in play. This is really tough for Tiz to deal with. And there's still a lot of burn yet to come. Double Wicked Stab, Rune Dorb. When you play Rune Dorb in Rogue, it almost always finds more damage. That's true. Tiz does have ways to clear the Alex alone with Shadow Word Ruin, or he can clear the whole board if he puts Apotheosis on the Neophyte and then Hysteria's the Alex. Mm. It's a valuable card to lose though, that would be his second Apotheosis used for not very much healing at all. So it looks like he's going to start the Sethic Train and end on Ruin if he doesn't find something better to deal with the Alex! Oh my goodness! <laughs> Miracle Priest! You called it right all along, Gia. It is Miracle Priest. Combo Priest, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Control and Combo Priest are next to each other on the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, CO. I've read enough here. I'm clicking it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Alan's mindset has definitely shifted in terms of how much board he can actually gain because he's over John Kazakas, right? However, he's already seen that Tiz did not clear this mm. entire first board, so. Getting through these Sethics and landing a Jandis has to be pretty valuable here. Yeah, Jandis is definitely where my head is at. I was just wondering if it's worth trading the Penflinger if your mana is that tight and you would rather, um, you know, bump in with the attack rather than having to spend the one mana on yeah. playing it for the battle mm. cry. Uh, but I guess you could just... Possible. Yeah, you could just see what you get off of Jandis first, I suppose. Rain freeze smites. Oh, okay. Oh, he's not going to chant this at all. Interesting. I'm not a big fan of that, to be honest. There's very little pressure he's developing without her. It's really interesting, right? Because. Yes, he develops less pressure by not going Jandis. However, he gets to push 5 damage face on this turn, whereas otherwise it very possibly would have had to have traded into the 1-1 one, one Divine Shield Sethic twice. Um, and so, with the amount of damage he gets face, and the fact he gets to play a Neophyte, I actually feel like this might be worth it. Uh, you know, it's, it's obviously less... Uh, like the Janus plan was more vulnerable to board clears because you haven't pushed the damage, whereas this I think plays into the burn plan uh, that I like the look of a lot. I just didn't know how likely it is is to have board clears by that point. Yeah, because that's fair. He's just used so many resources on that previous board. Um, if there is, however, the um, Samuro or something in hand, he's also just seen double apotheosis. Both lines definitely have their merits, and like you said, Alan has still put Tiz in a situation where he does have to go for some board clear, even only faced with 8 damage, compared to what Jandis had could have uh, put on board. And the Hysteria only deals with 5 of this damage, a lot of the, or 6. <sighs> yeah, what this does as well, whether or not Alan was uh, intending it, is it just locks out uh, Ysera as a play. He's just dead to double Wicked Stab if he does that, which is, I think, 
too much of a too scary of a situation to put yourself in as the priest you're more likely to be able to get a win with yog Sauron on the following turn honestly i was considering just like throwing down wave of apathy at the end because it saves you two health uh, but as long as yog is online the game plan is still the same or is it 100 percent online i haven't really counted how many spells he <laughs> is uh i have no idea uh, i'm just presuming i mean he's played literally only spells so far apart from an ogre okay, answer so i feel like it's quite likely yeah and if he didn't just throw the wave down to like say get it from nine to ten i feel like it's quite likely as well so alan doing his best to prevent any outs wow. other than yog really that's not interested in jandas this entire game trying to get to mancrick's wife you'd have to assume that's burn not missing it hurts quite a bit but off the passage, almost guaranteed almost to just play it for three mana. Yeah, and if not, if it is the bottom card, then that's kind of better, because then you can just play something else, which will proc it anyway at that point. Uh, but it is just going to be Mancrix. Yeah, exactly. Mancrix wife going to get it. Anyway, there pushes the damage. Lethal represented from hand, of course, with double Wicked Stab going to rank three next turn. So we need a miracle from our Lord and Savior, Mr. Yogg-Saron. It has come to this! This is in Tiz's deck for a reason, and here we go. <gasps> oh my oh god! Oh my gosh! The 5%er! Is that the odds? 5%? Okay. That's bad. That's very bad. Yogg is saving time. Oh my <laughs> god, what the heck? <laughs> 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 okay, make no mistake, that was the most likely outcome. Is it of course. Nice because he was on less HP than Alan, but <laughs> for it to happen off the first two hits when there was like seven other targets <laughs> is hilarious. <Yeah. laughs> Pretty hilarious. I like to see Tiz trying his hand at a uh, sarcastic clap as well. It's been working so well over in the Americas region. Let's try our hand at that uh, here in Asia Pacific. An unfortunate loss uh, for Tiz. His priest deck just really not coming together. He didn't draw any minions. The only ones he found uh, were the Ogamancer, obviously, Ysera not really doing anything, and then Yogg-Saron. Uh, right at the end, not getting there. It's just what happens if you don't gain board control at the start. Uh, it's so difficult to be able to try and uh, do anything after that because the rogue just draws a billion cards. Like when they don't have to spend their mana removing the priest's board, they go crazy. They do whatever they want. It's interesting how hard Tiz lost the board without ever having seen Jandis or Kazakas come down and the Mancrick's wife at the very bottom of the deck. Like, that almost never happens that Rogue is able to get there with their wimpy minions, but it so happened Tiz only had the one for them, and I'm so glad we got to see this instant replay. Sorry, it was six other targets, but that was still hilarious. <laughs> it was hilarious. The 5% into, I don't even want to guess what the percentage was there. Uh, well, I guess, what, one in seven, one in seven. Pretty unlikely still, none, uh, nonetheless, uh, for Tiz to be losing there. And it does mean that he has to queue up the Miracle Rogue, the Mirror, to try and reverse sweep Alan. He's got the Mirror, obviously, as I just said, against the Rogue. He's got the Mage. He's got the Warlock. It's not unwinnable. I'd say he's got a chance here. He does, but it often feels really bad to have lost his counter Q on top of that. So if anything, it's the mental here for Tiz. I do think the Mirror will be his toughest matchup of the three remaining. So if he does take this win, it's definitely still possible. But in terms of the rogue play or the fluidity of the game plans so far from what we've seen of Alan and Tiz this weekend, I do feel like Tiz might not be the most comfortable on the rogue. It does feel that way, I, I will admit. Uh, like, his decision yesterday, of course, which was keeping the, uh, what was it, the field contact on the play rather than on the coin, which we always talk about as the Gabby line. And I was actually in, I think it was like Orange's chat a while ago with Gabby, where I was memeing a little bit, saying in every situation where field contact was available, oh, Gabby would keep it here. Oh, Gabby would keep it there. And he actually said, no, I wouldn't. That's stupid. It was a specific situation <laughs> I kept it in, in my Masters Tour run. Like, we kind of ran away with the meme that he always keeps keeps it in every situation. Uh, because you do have to be careful with it. Field Contact, very arguably, is the best card in Rogue, just because of what it does for such a small amount of mana. But it needs a lot of help. It needs a lot of support to get there. And you can't just be keeping it willy-nilly. 
uh, as we arguably saw Tiz do. Uh, but already, right at the start, two pretty good hands for both our players. Yeah, we got early man cricks on both sides, but Tiz has... Wow! A good way to use Foxy this turn, and I was gonna say, Kazakus to follow up, and then the 5 drop is the most powerful curve you can do as Rogue without Octobot. And yes, Alan has Neophyte, but Tiz is just not gonna play spells for a very long time and be happy about it. Worth saying though, Alan did have Man Crick available in the Mulligan though, right? Which is a card that I look... Like, I, I very rarely, if ever, uh, mulligan Kazakas out of my starting hand. Um, and so he's clearly looking for something a little bit more aggressive, trying to find the Octobot, the fast field contact hands. Uh, but he hasn't found that. He had what was a decent hand with a good amount of card draw, but it's not keeping up against all this. Definitely not. Stealth available. If you don't get Rush or Divine Shield, that's often third on my list. Like, Rush... Arguably even third, depending on the situation. Like, if you're far enough ahead, you're very free to take stealth. He got, I think, both copy and plus two, plus two. Uh, yeah. Man. I think copy is the safest way to go because he doesn't have, like, the cleanest trades into the man trick, right? He has to put his own down to 3-1. You have to expect Alan's gonna respond to this in some form. So, I like taking the safer option, which is still super strong. I do think I agree. The, the one thing I will say is that when you have specifically stealth and plus two, plus two, you can play it even if it only buffs one, maybe even zero minions, and then try and play out more minions next turn and then bounce it and play it again uh, for a buff two turns in a row. Uh, but for Alan, picking up the, uh, the man crick in rage, that is exactly the kind of card that you need. Yeah, he was so far behind. Honestly, Starting with the coin into Swindle, you'd have to think he was gearing up for Brain Freeze Dagger to end the turn. Now he has ways to use Pen Flinger potentially. Still mm. not clean. It doesn't develop the dagger, but it saves him a bit of health. Yeah, I'm looking at like Octobot, shoot your own Octobot, but then of course you don't clear the Man Crick with the Pen Flinger, which is pretty rough. Oh, it is rough, but that's quite strong, right? And he gets the pen finger back in hand. I think this is fine. Alan has kind of just decided here, even if this gets plus two, plus two, it's not that great of a board to buff into because it still True. dies to the three, seven man crick. I think it's a nice halfway play. Yeah, yep. take the copy. And he's going to be very happy with it. it. It probably was the better option no matter what. It was just, uh, I think, worth talking about the option of plus two, plus two. Uh, especially as now, while Tiz's hand has gone from very good to pretty bad with three bad draws, one after the other in Alex double brain freeze. Um, he still, of course, has the option to take a VT and replay one of them next turn. So the question is really just where does this man crick go? Does it go into the three seven to set up for that trade I was just talking about? Yeah, I think that's very smart from Tiz. Face is tempting because you feel like you need to be on the burn game plan with this little value, but it just never gets there, right? He knows there's a pen flinger in hand, and the 1-3 is not very significant in terms of the damage it can push forth. So I really like just setting up for a cleaner VT or even brain freeze dagger, and then trying to coast off these stealth golems to victory. Alan with a very cool line here, bouncing back the... Uh... Octobot, you are obviously looking at very heavily for Shadow Step, I would say, off of this Swindle, because being able to bounce back your Tenwu to keep it with what will be a very reduced Alexstrasza uh, is very, very powerful. Uh, but even if that isn't a possibility, just being able to go for seven mana Alexstrasza, even if it's to clear the board, is obviously super strong. Ooh, that's burn. He can reduce it to lot. four as well, because we're looking at Octobot Penflinger. And I love that Penflinger has hit a place after its nerf where it's still niche in some decks, and you're able to find these situations where, as Rogue, I don't need this anymore. Let me leave it on the board. That is an interesting top deck, though. The game plan of bouncing back the Golem, I... F mm. I was going to say goes out the window. You still have a reasonable turn of bouncing it back, playing it for three mana, and going for two or three brain freezes. But this looks better. <laughs> and this does get more power on board, because in order right. to like step the golems, you have to remove five to begin with. And so you only net five by playing another golem. So I am in favor of the Jandis line. I don't think Tiz was going to beat Alan's race potential if he had just gone for more golems. Now he gets a Goliath instead and a Mozaki. And Alan is looking at a lot of burn damage, but he really doesn't want to send it into minions. 
So he has 24 burn damage overall, if you count the three minion attacks as well, because he has uh, 8, 16, 21, 24. So he could have uh, get away with sending one of these attacks into a minion if he wants to, like send two of them face and then pen fling it into the totem goliath, and then just point everything else at the face and kill him with Alexstrasza the next turn and pray that you aren't dead. Yeah, super smart from Alan. He also leaves himself the one thief not having attacked yet in case Tiz went for some mind games and put the illusion on the wrong minion. Well, at least from Alan's perspective. Oh, oh okay, this is he's smart. going to trade off that instead. This is very, very smart. This still gives him exact lethal next turn with Alex Straza, but it removes a full five damage off the board. A very, very smart optimization. Yeah. I wasn't sure that the illusion was on the golem, but even if it were, if he hit that, he would have left a little bit more damage than killing the 5-2 on board because of the 1-1 one, one totem that spawns. Which makes yeah, sense. Tiz has to know it. Yeah, it's just pretty much a lock victory at this point with Sandhoof Waterbearer out of the pool of five cost minions. There's nothing that immediately heals you. Tiz kind of knows exactly what's up. It's been a double Octobot uh, discount this game. His opponent just put him to exactly eight health. There's only one play they're setting up for, but boy, was it beautifully set up. I love the way that Alan played this game. A great spot as well to be able to see that it was just there. He had well and truly lost the board to the Jandis and the Kazakas Golems, but Rogue is such a flexible deck that if you hit the right pieces, you don't even have to play for the board. And knowing that you can exploit the mirror in such a way that they just don't have ways to prevent Alex coming down is exactly the knowledge that sailed Alan through to a 3-0 victory straight to the finals against the world champion. Super impressively done. It was like a half hour series there from Alan, just dismantling his opponent on the rogue. And I think just showing perfect understanding of all the different matchups. Like if, we, if we think back to the rogue versus druid, obviously it wasn't an especially difficult game. He got the perfect hand uh, to just take it apart and go super wide on the board. But I think he sequenced it very well, going for the neophyte first, then the foxy swindle afterwards, tempoing out the field contact felt very smart. Rogue against priest, he was uh, prioritizing playing out the neophytes over and over rather than getting Jandis because he knew that face damage and setting up the burn was more important. And he knew that very well in the rogue mirror as well. He knew that board control is all very well, but if you just get burnt for 24 damage over two turns,